Every archaeological discovery is an opportunity to learn. By learning more about the past, we improve our understanding of how the world came to be the way it is today. Not every ancient artifact is capable of shedding new light on the past, but everything you're about to see in this video is. They're amazing discoveries from times long forgotten, and they come with incredible stories. In June 2021, Russian archaeologists came across the remains of an Ice Age cave bear in the Imanai Cave in the Bashkiria National Park right at the southernmost point of the Ural Mountains. A cave bear skeleton wouldn't normally interest archaeologists because they're more concerned with human history, but there's something unusual about this particular bear. To be more specific, it has a small hole in the back of its head. The experts think it's possible, perhaps even likely, that the hole was made by a spear. That's significant because the bear passed away around 35,000 years ago. It would be the earliest ever evidence of humans deliberately hunting cave bears. This wouldn't have been an especially demanding hunt because the evidence suggests that the spear went through the bear's skull while it was hibernating. It's possible that the hole was caused by a rock falling on the bear's head, or perhaps by water dripping on the skull for thousands of years, but a spear is still thought to be the most plausible explanation. We know that humans lived near these caves during the Pleistocene era, but the idea of them hunting bears is entirely new. Here's another interesting find from June 2021. In Poland, archaeologists have been called to a site in the town of Jaroslaw, where road workers have been maintaining both the road surface and some underground sewers. When they dug the present-day road up, they were surprised to find a much older road hidden beneath a section of it. They were even more surprised when they realized that the 100-foot-long road was made of wood. The archaeologists who arrived at the scene now believe that this is an 18th century passageway that once led to the city gate. Further excavation work was ordered, revealing the presence of other segments of the road elsewhere in the same region. Back when it was still in one piece, it would have been one of the longest wooden roads in Poland. That makes it all the stranger that it was so narrow. With a width of little more than 10 feet, there wouldn't have been room for two carriages to pass each other. Perhaps it was a one-way street for carriages as they passed through the town before heading back out again. Oddly, there's no sign of hoof prints or carriage grooves in the wood. Either the road wasn't used often, or the wood was replaced shortly before the road was abandoned. Historians often assume that the ancient Romans used and kept slaves during their occupation of Britain, but direct evidence of that has always been hard to find. That changed in April 2021, when a startling discovery was made in Great Casserton, Rutland, by builders working on a home extension. Imagine how shocked they must have been when they came across the shackled skeleton of a man buried deep below the house. The unfortunate individual was buried in a ditch with iron fetters attached to his ankles. It's the only known Roman era example of someone being buried this way. Archaeologists have been able to use radiocarbon dating to demonstrate that he was buried somewhere between the 3rd and the 4th centuries. It's thought that shackles were usually removed from slaves before burial so they could be reused. So this man must have done something very unusual to justify being buried in his. Perhaps it's a symbolic punishment for something he did in his lifetime, aimed at ensuring that he remained shackled during the afterlife. On the other hand, maybe it's not what it appears to be. A few ancient Roman manuscripts claim that the dead were sometimes shackled to ensure that they didn't rise again to torment the living. So it's possible that this is evidence of that practice, rather than anything to do with slavery. Even though the famous stone circle of Stonehenge in Wiltshire, England has been studied extensively by archaeologists over many decades, there are still countless mysteries about the site to be solved. One of them is the matter of just over 40 of the site's smaller stones, known as blue stones. They don't come from anywhere in the surrounding area. Instead, they were quarried from the Presley Hills in Pembrokeshire, Wales. That's almost 200 miles away and begs the question of how anyone could have transported them so far 5,000 years ago. In 2019, 
a new study pinpointed the precise location in the hills that the stones were taken from. Academics have been able to determine that the rocks were eased away by using wedges to open up vertical points between each natural pillar of rock at the sites. Human-made stone and wood platforms have been found in the valley beneath the site of Cairn Gyodog in the Presley Hills. They were presumably made and used by Stonehenge's architects. This might finally explain precisely where the stones came from and how they were broken from their native hillsides. But it still doesn't explain why or how they were transported across such an enormous distance. There was plenty of excitement among historians in Guatemala in 2012 when archaeologists finally located the tomb of Lady Cabell. The 7th century ruler is considered to be among the greatest queens of the classic Mayan era and is known as the Maya Holy Snake Lord. Her tomb was found during excavations of the Mayan royal city of El Peruaca, which can be found in northwestern Paten. The artifact that gave away the identity of the royal tomb's owner was a tiny carved alabaster vessel carved in the shape of a conch shell. An inscription shows the head and arm of a mature woman rising from the opening of the shell. This familiar depiction, along with four glyphs that appear elsewhere on the jar, was enough for the archaeologists to be certain they'd found what they were looking for. Kabel ruled with her husband, Kinich Balem, for two decades during the 7th century, during which she was also the military governor of the Wak Kingdom. Her family was known as the Imperial House of the Snake King, and her title, Kalumta, translates into English as Supreme Warrior. She doesn't sound like someone you'd want to mess with. In fact, it was probably an act of bravery to break into her tomb. The Grotta di Cervi in Italy is often hailed as the home of Europe's greatest ancient works of cave art, but probably only deserves to be second on that list. The true honor should go to the Magura Cave in Rabishi, Bulgaria. The near prehistoric wall cave and wall paintings you'll find inside it are thought of as the most accomplished and significant post-Paleolithic era works of art in all of Europe. People came to paint here for hundreds, if not thousands of years, with paintings from the Neolithic, Eneolithic, and Early Bronze Age all appearing. The oldest of the paintings is thought to be around 10,000 years old. Most of the scenes deal with everyday activities like hunting and feasting, but there are also depictions of ancient gods and what might be religious ceremonies. Archaeologists Panka Vlakova Stova and Alexi Stova even claim that a grouping of black and white squares might represent an early attempt at creating a solar calendar. In many cases, bat guano was used as the medium for the artist's expression. Since 1993, access to the caves has been restricted in an attempt to preserve the works of art for future generations. In December 2015, a team of Swedish archaeologists performed a survey on two New Kingdom chapels in the Gebel al Sisila town of Aswan, Egypt. The chapels, known as Chapel 30 and Chapel 31, had been studied many times before, and yet the Swedes managed to find something new. Hidden away in two niches are six figures carved directly into sandstone. These are remarkable discoveries, and not just because everyone else who studied the area appears to have missed them. At some point in the very distant past, the Gable al Silsia area was buried under debris after being struck by a devastating earthquake. It was long thought that almost everything of value in the area had been ruined. Prominent Argentinian Egyptologist Ricardo Caminos even once described Chapel 30 as totally destroyed. He was wrong. It's now thought that one of the niches shows the chapel's owner, Neferquie, and his wife sitting on chairs while the other represents his entire family. Even without the earthquake, it's amazing the carvings have survived for so long. During the 18th century, this entire area was used as a quarry site. After the Romans left Great Britain, the next culture to occupy and control the land was the Anglo-Saxons. The UK is full of Anglo-Saxon relics and ruins, 
but archaeologists believed that they'd at least managed to identify every ancient Anglo-Saxon settlement until a previously unknown one was identified in early 2016. We don't blame them for struggling to find it. It's thought that the area of Lincolnshire it once stood on, not far from what's now Louth, used to be an island. It was founded and occupied by the Anglo-Saxons around 1,350 years ago. Based on the artifacts that have been discovered there thus far, it may have been an ancient trading center. That theory is based on the array of valuable goods that archaeologists have been able to retrieve from the site, including elaborately decorated glass counters and an ornate 8th century silver stylus. A plethora of 8th and 9th century coins have also been recovered, along with a small lead tablet engraved with the name Kudberg. That was a popular female name of the era. So much Saxon pottery has been found here that there may have even been a large-scale production center in the area. Watching the heavens has been a human preoccupation since time immemorial. Here's an example of what a celestial observatory would have looked like more than 1,500 years ago. This ancient observatory, thought to have been built during the 3rd or 4th century, was found during archaeological surveys in the south of Iran in 2017. The archaeologists responsible for the discovery believe it to be a product of the Sasanian dynasty, which ruled the area from the year 224 all the way through to the year 651. Theirs was the last imperial dynasty to rule Persia before the arrival of Islam. Despite the obvious architectural and technical knowledge that went into the creation of this site, it's thought that what the Sasanians knew about both astronomy and astrology came from observing the ancient Greeks and Hindus. What's odd about this location, which is in the Kormorsgan province, is that there isn't a settlement from the same era nearby. It looks like the Sasanians traveled far from their homes to make their astronomical observations. If this happened today, we'd say it was because there's less light pollution in remote locations. But that was hardly a problem back then. The teachings of Confucius were very important to the early development of Japan. We suppose that makes this ancient manuscript one of the most important documents in Japanese history. It's 1,500 years old, which makes it the oldest known work of Confucian teachings in the entire country. In fact, the entire Japanese nation was barely at the beginnings of its emergence back then. Rather than containing work by Confucius himself, the manuscript is a collection of commentaries and essays on his teachings. It's thought to have been assembled by Chinese scholar Huang Khan during the early 6th century. Markings on the pages suggest that at one stage it was owned by the Fujiwara clan. How it came to be in Japan is uncertain, but the most popular idea is that it was brought there by diplomats or emissaries from either the Sui or Tang dynasties that would be consistent with ownership of the manuscript by the Fujiwaras, who dominated the Japanese government during much of the Nara era of the 8th century. However, there are questions to be answered here. The whereabouts of the manuscript between the 8th century and the day it was found in the collection of a rare book dealer in 2017 are unknown. And until that matter is resolved, there will be some Japanese historians who refuse to accept it as a genuine artifact. Salt has been used for many purposes over the centuries, but is it possible that the ancient Maya once used it as a type of currency? According to a study that was published in March 2021, perhaps so. The idea of salt as Mayan money comes from a new analysis of a mural painted over 2,500 years ago at the site of Calakmul in Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. The mural is thought to be a representation of daily life and shows a salt vendor handing a salt cake wrapped in leaves to another person who holds a large spoon over a basket of salt. It was once thought to be the oldest record of salt being sold at a Mayan marketplace, but it might be more significant than that. Archaeologist Heather McKillop believes it represents individuals trading salt that has been transported in canoes from southern Belize, where the remains of salt kitchen buildings have been found in the past. Heather has mapped more than 70 sites in the region where salt was made in industrial quantities by boiling brine in pots. 
the amount of salt being produced would have been far beyond anything that the people of the time might reasonably have required, so it might have been Maya's chief export, or perhaps even its currency. In 2016, Danish treasure hunter Karsten Helm went out with his young sons in the hope of finding artifacts on the Danish island of Lalland. The history of human settlement on the island goes back thousands of years, so it's a good place to look. It was the Helm family's lucky day. Together, they found a collection of gold treasures dating back around 1,500 years, including an incredibly rare Odin amulet. The artifact is a medallion made of thin gold leaf and was probably worn as jewelry. Although the image of the figure depicted on its surface isn't clear, the accompanying inscriptions of the words, the high one, makes it unlikely to be anyone other than Odin. Only three such amulets have ever been found on Lalland, and this is the first since 1906. Aside from the amulet, the Helm family also located another gold pendant, a gold ring, gold coins, and three pieces of gold that might once have been part of a necklace. All of their finds are now on permanent display to the public in the local Maribo County Museum. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications, and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching and see you soon.